Today on Mean Brews, we cover the refreshing American wheat beer. So grab a beer, have a seat as we dive into the style. This episode is brought to you by the Master Home Brewer Program. Earn awards and badges based upon how you score in homebrewing competitions across the world. Sign up now at ciailers.org. American style wheat beer is an enigma. At first glance, you think it's going to taste something like the German style wheat beers with their wonderful banana and clove characteristics. However, it's much more closely related to our uh, cream ales and our American style light lagers than it ever was to the German style beers. Um, It's truly a gateway beer into craft. I can remember the first time I had one of the the brothers wheat beers from the west coast and just marveling at the wonderful flavors that we got from that. Little did I know that what I was diving into and I would be getting into some more intense and crazy IPAs and stouts and other types of beers. It's a wonderful refreshing beer, great beer for summer. Um, with that said, let's let's get right into it. American wheat beer. So the number of recipes we had for American wheat beer was only 15 recipes. It's actually pretty high for uh, our database. Uh, the dates range from 2002 to 2019. Three of the beers were in the NHC uh, as winners, and we had one MCAB winner, Master Championship of American Brewers. The most um, winning entries were golds and we had one best of show more than 50 percent of the beers were gold metal metal beers style overview it's a subset subset of bjcp1 that's 1d uh, bjcp describes and i quote refreshing wheat beers that can display more hop character and less yeast character than their german cousins a clean fermentation character allows bready doughy or grainy wheat flavors to be complemented by hop flavor and bitterness rather than yeast qualities now, through my data, I found that this is something that uh, has evolved over time, and I will show you how uh, the perception of the beer and the, really the balance of the beer has changed uh, between the 2002-2019 dates of entries that I've seen. Uh, also, there's a tremendous variation, more in some areas than others, and I'll get into that in later slides. Original Gravity. Um, last week, we presented on the Hefeweizen, which tended to be on the high side of the BJCP guidelines. This original gravity is right dead set in the middle, right at 1.048. The data set range is between 1.040 to 1.056, you know, right there within the tops and bottoms of what the guidelines say you should do. This is not a beer where people just try to overload you with malt and with body. IBUs, the IBUs ranged from uh, 11.8 to 43.8. Um, again, not so much on the high side. Um, this is taking amalgamation from all the dates, and I think if you looked at the later um, recipes, you'd see a higher a higher IBU number. In fact, what I plotted was um, IBUs over gravity units, and basically these are points. Like uh, if the beer is 1.048, so it'd be in and 48 IBUs, it'd be 48 IBUs over 48 points, so that's one, right? So comparing the the different recipes against the trend line over time, what we see is almost a 50% or more increase in uh, the the ratio of hop bitterness to gravity. I think this is trending along with the, the propensity of people to really enjoy IPAs and more hoppy styles of American pale ales and beers. So this is definitely something you want to take into consideration when you, if you decide to enter a competition and that the judges are seeking out those more hoppy balanced beers uh, than the beers of the past, which were more neutral flavored. As far as color, again, no, nothing really different from what's in BJCP. Just aim for right in the middle of that uh, color curve here. 
Um, the malt types, when you average all the types of malts that are used in all these 15 recipes, 97.5 were base malts. Um, had a little bit more variation than Hefeweizen, which we just had pills and, and wheat. Um, but um, only 1% crystal malts, 1.1% toast malts, and half a percent of adjuncts. Base malts. Let's talk a little bit about the base malts that people used. Um, again, I'm representing the height of the curve as the percentage of recipes that used that base malt. So we'll start there. And wheat and two row or pilsner, three of the recipes use pilsner. I grouped, this, I grouped two row and pilsner together just to make it easier. Um, you can have your choice if you want to mix or use one. It's your choice, uh, depending on what you want to do. 100% of the recipes used a two-row pale malt along with wheat. Um, about 35% of the grain bills used, 36% used a Munich. I'm assuming a light Munich, they didn't say. 14% uh, used a Vienna malt. And 7% one used rye. I didn't mention in the beginning that I've excluded rye. It's typically American rye beer is included in the style, the subset of the style. But I've excluded rye because there was only one winning recipe that I found in all my research that I've done. Uh, the highs and lows, again, are seen here. Um, if, the, if the malt were used, the average percentage of the grist was 50% for wheat, 41% uh, for two-row, 17% for Vienna, 10% for Munich, and 6% for rye. And the data ranges, I won't go through that, but uh, you can read them here on this slide or on the graph. Um, I would say, based upon the small amount of percentage used of Vienna and rye, wouldn't recommend using uh, either of these malts um, in, in your American wheat beer recipes. Other malts, um, again, we'll start with the percentage of recipes that have used these malts. 14% of recipes used Crystal 10 or a honey malt. 7% uh, of recipes use care pills or a flaked wheat. Uh, the ranges are here. The, the seven percenters only had one data point, so they have no ranges. Um, the the uh, range for the, uh, which one is that? The honey malt was 3 to 13%, so a big variation between the data. And the range for the crystal was 5 and 6, so it was a really sharp curve. You can see that red curve there is very sharp. Um, again, these others were, were did not have a range because it was a single data set, data point. If these specialty malts were used, honey malt was used in a, as 8% of the grist, and flaked wheat as 7%, and crystal and carapils around 4 or 5% of the grist. Hop additions, um, aroma, flavor and bittering hops were used in almost all the recipes, I think 90% or above for, for the bittering. Um, aroma and flavor were above 50%, so definitely recommend getting those punch, those hop flavor punches in your recipe. Um, two and one, that should be one, of the recipes added Whirlpool and Dry Hops. Uh, these are in the later uh, winners. So definitely, again, lending towards the movement towards a more hoppy beer. Um, re I recommend using three uh, hop additions, uh, just a bittering, a flavor, and aroma. Or y you could try this. I think, you know, I think this is starting to emerge in the style. Um, but it's up to you. Only since 2013 were uh, beers with dry or whirlpool hops added. Bittering hops were all over the place. Eight of them were European, seven were American. Don't think it really matters, to be honest with you. Importance of uh, flavor hops, six out of the nine were of American variety, so we're starting to see when the flavor comes into it, you need to make sure that you're using a, uh, you know, a variety that uh, has the American style flavors. Definitely towards, towards the majority of the, the newer recipes, I don't think anyone used a, a German or, um, you know, a British style of um, hops for any of their beers. On aroma hops, um, Amarillo is the clear winner here with 33% of the recipes using Amarillo. 
Um, other big ones were Centennial and Cascade, that citrus punch, you know, grapefruit, uh, really fits in well with the style. 92% of the recipes used um, new German, new American varieties over the German varieties of, uh, of um, hops. And one recipe used the Haller Blanc and Mandarina Bavaria, kind of going to the fruity side as well. Whirlpool and Dry Hops, only two recipes used Whirlpool hops, and they were split between Citra, Eldorado, and Amarillo. Uh, one recipe had Citra as a dry hop. Now, hops are hard to uh, understand how um, what to use because they're all over the board. So what I did was I went into each one of the hops, the late edition hops used, pulled out all the flavor descriptors of all those hops, that everybody used and tried to group them into something that made sense. Um, and so if you look here, this is a this is a pie chart of all the flavor descriptors of all the hops and how many times it was used in a recipe. And so the biggest ones in the top right, floral. Um, eight of the recipes used a hop that had a floral ca character. And what I thought was interesting is uh, 16 used something with a citrus note. And if you kind of read the style guidelines, this totally fits what the guidelines say. And so my recommendation is not on a hop variety, but more so look towards hops that have um, their biggest flavor contribution being something floral and citrus or floral or citrus. Um, you could even put tropical in there and passion fruit. Those, those have those citrus notes as well. I think that's what this style really needs, uh, more so than the piney herbal you know other notes here these aren't all the flavor descriptors but these are the one these are the top few that i pulled from uh, my research that i studied on the yeast uh, the clean st strains tended to dominate the you know chico at 20 percent coal two coal strains an alt strain of bavarian even a lager strain was used white yeast 1010 was used in two recipes um, it's an american wheat um, yeast blend, yeast that is real clean and crisp um, some of the the yeast with more character, like uh, the, all the British Isle strains uh, or the East Coast USA um, ale strain, were used in 28% of the recipes. But these are majority of uh, old recipes, recipes that were, you know, in the early 2000s had success. Uh, as the hop character has taken over more and more for these styles, um, the you're seeing more clean strains used. Uh, mash type. Again, I was kind of surprised to see 45% use the step mash, but with this much wheat, you're going to need to do something with that protein. Um, on the mashed rests, um, three were prominent. Um, we saw, um, you know, a frulic acid type rest down here, maybe for some, some beers trying to get those uh, banana type esters to emerge. Everyone, again, had a sacrification rest, and uh, there's uh, definitely a... Uh, um, you know, protein rest used in 45% of the, the recipes. This is something I would recommend. And their ranges, are, again, are included in these dotted lines here. One recipe had a, you know, a, I can't pronounce it, the horse scratch, uh, uh mash schedule where you have your beta and your, your alpha rests. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't intend to use for this style a beta alpha maze uh, rest. Boil duration, um, you know, pretty standard boil duration. Um, we had just one data point at 90, which kind of threw the curve to the right. Most of them were at 60 minutes. I would, wouldn't recommend going over 60 minutes for this style. This is where it gets kind of unique. Um, since we did have a lager strain in one of the styles, it really pulled out the bell curve, um, which is the blue curve. Um, so I threw it out. I threw out the high and the low fermentation temperatures. Try to give you a sense of where people are picking these temperatures for the different strains of yeasts. Um, so the max strain, max temperature of 70 was a Weizen strain. Um, and the low temperature ones in the 60s were the Kolsch strains. Uh, Chico kind of ranged from 63 to 68. Um, so these are the, uh, and the British strains kind of in that range as well. Um, I would stay within this. Um, go colder if you're Kolsch. Go warmer if you want those esters. Um, if you want to go clean, somewhere between 62 and 65, I think, is the recommended. Water profile, there's very little data on the water used for this style. Um, Palmer's Water and Kaminsky's Water Book 
recommend 5,200 parts per million calcium, 100, 200 parts per million sulfate, and 5,200 chloride. Um, it's recommended that you acidify the mash in sparge water because there's no malts in there that are going to help you. Um, and I think if you used, you know, yellow balanced or yellow dry, you may get to, those may be good brewing water water profiles to use for this style. Carbonation, a bunch of different carbonations. Again, the, the average of them is 2.5. Um, not as much data here as the last recipe we went through. Um, brewing classic styles, you know, it says you shouldn't have that banana clove character. Um, you should look for floral or citrus hops. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, and it recommends uh, using the Chico or a Coal Strain. So, you know, when I read this after I went through the data, I was like, well, that data is pointing out exactly what they're saying here. So my suggested recipe, um, again, a very simple one. Um, I would use, you know, somewhere around a 50-40 split of uh, wheat to pale malt and throw in a little Munich. Munich was so prominent in there as well as the honey um, the honey malts in some recipes, I think there needs to be a little bit of a, of a toasty honey type character. Um, I've kind of taken some liberties on some hops. You know, Laurel was, Laurel is not a hop that was in any of the recipes, but if you're looking for that floral citrus character, you know, I had a beer recently with Laurel made with hundred percent Laurel and I think it fits the bill. Those are its two major flavor, um, attributes, citrus, floral, even lemon, um, you know, those are the majority of the things you're looking for in this style. I definitely want to try uh, to brew a beer with this to see how it turns out. And I'd go with the California Ale, 001. You know, old standby, predictable. Um, we know how it works. Shoot for an OG of 1.048 with 34 IBUs. That's on the high side. Um, kind of trying to reach what they're doing recently. I'd uh, use straight up RO water and I'd add salts to get uh, 50 parts per million sulfite and 100 parts per million chloride. I would do a two-part step mash, 15 minutes at 128, and 60 minutes at 153. Sparge as usual and boil for the standard 60 minutes. I'm going to ferment at 62, um, oxygen rate, oxygenate and pitch at a rate of 1 to 1 1.5 million cells. I want a clean, clean beer. Uh, let it rise to 64, and then when fermentation starts to tail off, you know, raise it again to about 68 and hold for a week. Uh, rack it to a bottle or keg and carbonate and drink. Well, that's the end of the slideshow. And uh, now we're going to go and find out what style we're going to do next week. Let's switch over to that window. And we're going to do, an, oh, New Zealand pills. This will be exciting. I've never brewed one and I'm going to have to do some research. I know a couple people that have brewed some successfully and one that has won with them. Um, hopefully he's watching this episode right here. Um, again, if you like the show, please subscribe, hit the notification bell. Um, if you've got any ideas or uh, things we could change, things you like, things you don't like, what did we miss, please let us know. Um, if you want to send us your recipe, please do. If you've got a New Zealand Bills, please, and you've won with it, please send me your recipe. I need that uh, very badly. I've got one data point. Um uh, send it to meanbrews at gmail.com. We'll definitely use it uh, in the next episode. Um, again, thank you very much, and I hope you have a good day. Bye-bye.